So today we're here to gather on the topic of peer learning. Um, but before we get there, uh, just to again reflect on, this is the Eighth Hilt Conference. And um, this conference has covered a broad, broad range of topics, um, ranging from how does distance affect student engagement to interactivity to how we even evaluate teaching. Um, today we're focusing on peer learning, and so I thought I'd just say a couple words about why this topic. Um, well, why the same? Well, one was that there was a huge amount of interest as we went out and talked to different folks, partners across the university, Hugsies Teaching and Learning Lab, um, the Harvard Institute for Learning and Retirement, uh, Harvard College Writing Center, Biostatistics, Box Center, so on and so forth. They all resonated with the theme, and we just took that as a great indicator of this is something we want to hop on. Um, a second is the recognition of students um, as a crucial part of the educational ecosystem. I think we all know it, and Alan's remarks kind of um, uh, give that lens as well, but really to try to put a spotlight on that and, and see where we can go from there. Um, I think it also is an opportunity to reflect on how much faculty and staff learn from each other, right? Not just students learning from each other, but how much we all learn from each other. So personally, I get to learn about pedagogic practices that are at the frontier. I learn about the frontiers of research from my colleagues in political science and other disciplines. I learn about how a big organization like Harvard works, and I'm in elementary school there. Um, and a number of folks furthermore at Harvard have been leaders in developing um, approaches to peer learning. Uh, Eric Mazur couldn't be here, but he literally wrote the book on it. So I think all of this suggested to us that this is an opportunity for us to seize on. And today what we're really trying to do is really bring a 360 degree um, approach to uh, talking about peer learning. So uh, this afternoon, we're going to have an amazing panel uh, with um, Robin Gittleman and uh, Rakesh, Dinka Rakesh Karana. And that's going to be focusing more on some institutional aspects of, uh, of peer learning. But what I want to do now is introduce the morning panel, and very briefly. Um, so as I mentioned, we are thinking about this as a kind of a 360 degree approach uh, to peer learning. And as you see uh, in the breakout sessions, we're covering a lot of ground there. But our plenary sessions are going to cover a lot of ground as well. And in particular, what we wanted to do is have a conversation with people who are engaged in peer learning, but are doing so in environments that might not be your standard classroom environment. Or even if it is a classroom environment, it's um, around things that some might consider to be extracurricular or co-curricular, um, et cetera. So uh, we were very then fortunate to be able to find uh, a couple of people who sit fit that bill. So Cecil Adderley is the chair of Berkeley's music education department and has over 30 years of teaching at all different levels. Um, he's performed occasionally as a clarinetist and a violinist. He has performed as an actor and as a tango dancer, I understand. In other words, he's way cooler than all of us. Um, he works um, with a broad uh, set of audiences and is the um, uh, received the Massachusetts Music Education uh, Visionary Leadership Award and is the president of that organization as well. Um, he's provided thoughtful commentary on peer learning uh, for many years. Uh, Mike Way is the uh, men's and women's uh, squash coach here at Harvard University. Um, he was an internationally renowned competitor in squash and is one of the most successful squash coaches in the world. Um, just to give you some, uh, some data, the Crimson men and women finished their respective 2018-19 seasons undefeated. Furthermore, and we did a little bit more digging, the women's team, every player on the team won every single one of their matches in every competition. That's, uh, I would, that's crushing it. I don't, I, too bad for uh, our opponents. Um, finally, our moderator today is Erin Driver Lynn. She's an old friend, a mentor, and a peer. Erin um, is the Dean of Education over at the uh, Chan School for Public Health and in the Department of uh, Social and Behavioral Sciences. Um, she provides all sorts of leadership over there in the education space. Um, read her bio. She ran Hilt for many years. We would not be here um, without her efforts today. Um, so thank you, Erin. Thank you, panel. And let me invite you up to entertain us. We're going to start. Um, Right off the bat, just trying to learn a little bit more about who our wonderful guests are. Um, and so I'd like to ask a pair of uh, questions. Um, the first is, if you could describe a really concrete experience that you have had that had a meaningful impact on you, a learning experience. Ideally, this would be 
um, with a peer and co-curricular, sort of not in the classroom, to then contrast with uh, a very meaningful experience you might have had in the classroom, a learning experience that you would have had. So I'll start with you, Cecil. Oh, wow. <laughs> um, <clears throat> for me, let's see. If I were to compare the two, can I start in the classroom and then work my way back? Absolutely. Okay. Let's start in the classroom. Uh, both my brother and I are both educators. Um, and we bounce a lot of ideas off of each other. So I would have to say, from a classroom experience, um, in not being able to convey a particular concept to, to a student or groups of students, since we're talking about music in this case, um, I was having difficulty in really explaining how to do something in that ensemble setting. Um, and having that opportunity to learn from him not only because he's my brother, but he's my peer. Um, I could hear it better than the other people I would talk to, uh, other advisors, older uh, professors I had studied with to teach the same concept. It uh, had more meaning because I trust him. Um, he was someone I knew was going through the exact same experience that I'm going through. Um, and I've noticed that same thing in other activities as well outside of the, the the music realm. Uh, I'm going to put someone on the spot for what you're saying outside of that classroom. Uh, it was mentioned that I, would, I, would, I like to dance Argentine tango. And there's a particular person in here uh, that also dances tango. And I remember that when I moved to the Boston area, and I was really having a difficult time learning something. And no matter how much the instructor would um, explain this particular concept, this particular person um, who's here in, in the audience, one of the Harvard family, took me aside to explain <laughs> this particular concept and how to do it and actually moved me through the motion to understand it. And because I respect him uh, and admire his dancing, I was able to, to uh, emulate what he was doing and internalize that. And I think that's an important um, part of the process of sometimes, no matter how much we as the authority figure uh, try to um, impart information, that sometimes learning it from someone we trust and feel comfortable with uh, can make a huge difference in how we internalize it. Yeah. Thank you. You really did put someone on the spot, but they didn't stand up and what? <laughs> there. All right. <laughs> Wonderful. Yeah. Cute. That's that's great. I'm going to come back to some of the things okay. you said, Mike. Uh, it's it's uh, it's funny you mention uh, you mentioned your brother because I I spoke to my brother yesterday, uh, back in the UK about uh, you know just getting the right mindset. Um, uh, before I start, I just want to address um, uh, a comment that Alan made about um, that this the nine o'clock start is first thing in the morning. <laughs> okay, <clears throat> so. Um, my men's team, we did a strength and conditioning program at 7.15 today. What, what time did you wake up? <clears throat> um, about five. Um, so uh, actually, what my brother and I were laughing about, because the original, one of the questions from Marion was, what was, um, what was a, a lasting impact from school? And, and my brother and I, we went to, um, without sounding like a Charles Dickens novel, we went to a very old British grammar school and the most lasting impressions we both experienced were the welts on our backsides. So <clears throat> it wasn't really a fear of uh, failure, it was more a fear of flogging. Um, <laughs> it, did, uh, it did wonders for our survival skills, but um, my, um, uh, my sort of peer learning story is, is actually more recent. It's to do with my transition to Harvard. So um, uh, I'm a very passionate coach and I'd had a degree of success and some cred factor um, uh, and got the position here after 18 hours of interviews, by the way, <laughs> um, which was interesting in itself. Um, but I actually struggled large in the first season and I thought I'd really uh, accepted the wrong job and I told my boss at the end of the year, you've hired the wrong guy. Um, he turned the whole thing around on me. This is Tim Wheaton. He was a uh, He's the athletic director. He was an ex-coach. Um, 
he turned the whole thing around on me, did the right thing. He said, we hired the right guy, but you've got to meet the challenge. And the challenge was um, I'd been dealing, coaching in an individual sport, but not competing as a team, not dealing with the culture on the team, not dealing with um, uh, the academic stress and the stress of being at an institution such as this. Um, and as old as this dog is, what was tough for me is, is, was I felt that as the head coach, um, I had all the answers. And what I realized um, after that first season, I didn't have all the answers at all. Um, and Tim Wheaton and the, the tennis coach, Dave Fish, uh, helped me navigate those first few seasons. And if it hadn't been for them, to be honest, it would have been, uh, a very, it, was, it was stressful enough, but those guys that really helped me through. So that's my, that's my impression with uh, lasting impact from, uh, from two other coaches. That's wonderful. I just want to call out a couple things. Um, I really like the phrase you used of, um, I could hear it better from my brother. Yeah. Um, I think that's a, a fitting kind of phrase for peer learning. And the uh, emulate and internalize and what that means, the kind of imitation part um, that might be part of peer learning. Um, very memorable, a phrase you used of, uh, instead of fear, fear of failure, it became fear of flogging. Yeah. <laughs> you know, so motivation is a, a key part of what yeah. I think we're thinking about with, uh, with peer learning. And, and then that shift from uh, focus on the individual to focus on the culture of, of a group. Yeah. So uh, I'm hoping that we can not just have me ask questions and um, go sequentially and that we can really get into a dialogue. So I want to throw out a few sort of straightforward questions about uh, peer learning and, and then ask if we can just kind of uh, improvise a little and, and see what we can unpack about those things. So um, before I ask a question, I was trying to think, well, what is this panel really about? What has Dustin set us up here to do? And understanding that this is just, it's a huge space, peer learning. And, and so I, I thought I would just mention that I, I began to think of it as a kind of um, three categories. Uh, one would be sort of classroom learning, traditional classroom learning, our stereotype of classroom learning. Another would be co-curricular learning. And then a third that might be self-structured learning, sort of not co-curricular and organized, but self-structured self learning. And that there'd be two categories there, uh, peer learning, and then um, not peer learning, but instructor to student or expert to novice um, in, in that other category. So that's kind of a three by two. And thinking about the map of where we might be talking about here is some of those, those, those spaces. And then, and then just to say, here at Harvard, we have every bit of, of that um, space. And we have a, a very big uh, developmental swath of learning. We have collegiate learning. We have graduate learning. We have professional learning. We have uh, what our instructors, our postdocs, our research associates are learning. We have a lot of people who are farther in their career and who are coming to Harvard to learn through our online courses or through other things. So we, we have in this audience people who are working on that full space. And we have this moment to learn from the two of you. Um, and so when, when you are articulating what you think about peer learning and co-curricular learning, I hope we can locate our own connection from these, those different points of view in the, in the audience. So. Um, what is peer learning? Well, what is it? Um, well, it's, it's funny you talk about, I, I'd actually like, if I can take a couple of minutes to describe actually what we do. And um, I think we've got four, because the, the questions, when, when you first approached me, I thought, okay, I've got to start thinking about actually what is going on and how it's going on. Yeah. So I've got to stay, <clears throat> you'll all appreciate the fact, um, as a coach, I've got to stay in the coach's wheelhouse here. So um, if I can take a couple of minutes and explain what I think my job is about and what we do and how we do it. I think um, it, it'll be helpful from there on, at least from my perspective. Um, so we are, I, I regard my job as being in the business of developing real confidence and belief. So athletes 
who believe in themselves are more resilient and athletes who believe in themselves try harder for longer. We take our student athletes, we put them under stress. The stress is public, there's no hiding place. Cracks will appear and then we give them answers. So I call it stress with answers or guided stress. Through this process, I see four categories. The first one is to do with the environment. So the environment would be with the culture on the team, the way we do things here. What's above the line? What's below the line? Uh, taking responsibility, being accountable, contributing to the program, really understanding what synergy is. In an individual sport, some athletes believe it's okay to be neutral. Well, neutral is not an option. You either contribute and are neutral, you're actually stealing from the program. That would be the first one. The second category would what I would be calling um, an emotional one. So with emotional peer learning for us for in sport is getting through an injury, getting over a loss, the always the ever-present academic stress and the ever-present relationship aspect. So on the team, with the captains, with the coaches, in the dorms, and, uh, and their relationships on campus. The other two are more sport specific. So the next one, I call it dy dynamic peer learning, but I can't know, but just, just if that's the right term, but just to explain actually what's going on, I'm trying not to bore you here. Can I get you a cup of coffee, Cecil? While I'm talking? <laughs> so, <clears throat> so we're an individual sport and we've got to play as a team. We've got to somehow find the order, the lineup on that team. So believe it or not, most teams that compete individually do not have head-to-head -head challenge matches because it's, it can fracture the team. So they protect the kids from having any falling out just so... Um, that everyone is happy with each other in the environments uh, welcoming. But I don't believe in that. I actually believe in immersing the kids in stress, rehearsing their mental programs, which I'm coming to, and actually pushing their tolerance and pushing their threshold. Now, we talk about this. We don't just do it. So what happens, it goes like this. There's a, there's a hard ladder at the Muir Center, and if you lost the match before, we have a challenge match every week, Next to your name, your arrow is, uh, is pointing down. If you won your match last week, your arrow is pointing up. So every week, the winner plays the person above them. They're challenging up, and the loser is challenging down. This is a very stressful situation for the team. So the peer learning is, how are you going to handle this with a teammate who's one of your best friends, and you're now trying to beat them, and what is the peer learning post-match? So being respectful, um, showing empathy, um, suppressing your ego. Um, we also, as I said just now, we use these as an opportunity um, to train, to practice their mental programs and get them ready for, outside, for their outside matches. It's not easy, um, but it's something I think that, that as actually uh, the evidence is that it's quite a successful approach. The last one is set up by the coach, and um, I call it guided peer learning. So this is where we take um, an athlete on the team, and they will teach a mental program to a teammate. Now, mental training allows the athlete to execute the skills that they practice. If you don't do mental training when you're under stress, you're going to be in real trouble. So let me give you um, a phrase here from sports psychologist Kathy Crossland. Because when I, when I learned this in my first year here, it actually changed everything in the way I approached the mental program. So the mind under stress, and if there's any psychologists in here, you can contribute, please. The mind will grab hold of the strongest memory in the subconscious file when it's under stress. So my interpretation as coach is... Um, most repeated, first selected. So in an untrained mind, the thinking is spinning like a revolving door. Now, we name this untrained mind in my program, we call it the Oh My God file. <laughs> Everybody here 
has an Oh My God file. Oh my God, the lineup's long in flower this morning. Oh my, oh my God, it's raining. Oh my God, on the highway. So we all have these Oh My God files, and it depends on how quickly you get yourself out, um, and of course, conversely, how long you're staying in it, where the problems start. So the mental program teaches and trains the athlete how to interrupt the Oh My God file to bring some clarity to be able to send an instruction to self. So you've got, okay, sorry. You've got two files, I'm nearly done. You've got two files. The new file, we call our new files IQ, inner quiet. The athletes can name it whatever they want, but we've got two files that we work with. And we're working on this, maybe not every day, definitely every week. So I've got an oh my God file and I've got an IQ. When you do the mental program, which is, has a lot of components, every time you do it, you uh, deposit in IQ. Remember, what we're trying to do is to have more responses from IQ so that under stress, the mind is going to grab this thought. So, oh my God, will shrink and weaken as IQ develops. Oh my God's never disappear. I've still got some of mine. You still have yours. But that is the goal. The goal is to understand um, how to bring clarity and how to free yourself up to compete. So how does the peer learning work? Taking one athlete to teach his program, the programs are all the same but all different, to another athlete, both athletes deposit in their IQ file. So, and the peer learning is, is very, very powerful. We all know that saying, you know, we teach best what we most need to learn. Um, that's really when this is, this is taking off. Last thing I'm going to say, when, and you can experience this yourselves, whenever the oh my God file is interrupted in the moment you are in that, uh, uh, in that file, which is very difficult to do, usually we're aware of oh my God files afterwards. And we just go, oh, why did that last so long? Why didn't I grab that sooner? But we try and get our athletes, we teach them pointers to catch. We call it the catch. And when they catch, the first time they catch their oh my God file in a match, I cannot tell you how powerful that is in their IQ. Now, this IQ file and this awareness is not just about sport. We try and wake our kids up to their oh my God files this side of the river. And in so doing, so they, they, they may not be, uh, may not be the, exactly the same thing, but they're very close cousins. And what we're doing is we're raising this awareness. And it's this awareness, to, to quote David Brooks, that is the greatest agent for change. That's the end of my speech, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I don't have an, well. In, in the environment um, I teach, we're training, um, students to teach music from PK at preschool through 12th grade. And the, when we're looking at peer learning, we're looking at their level of collaboration, their level of teamwork, their ability to communicate not only with each other and the people that they're teaching, um, but with us, the professors who are teaching these courses, and then the ability to reflect on what they've had the opportunity um, to experiment with. Um, for example, there are a number of opportunities that we provide to our students uh, in our program um, to enable them to have this, these aha moments. Mm -hmm. um, it's from the time that they first take their first methods course, where we're focusing mainly on uh, teaching in the elementary school, elementary school music. And the instructors were all trying to provide them some structure, parameters to work within the lesson planning that you would expect uh, in an educational setting. Um, but prior to us uh, placing them in an environment where they really need to put that into practice, the opportunity for them to teach their peers is extremely powerful. Um, because they're, in this environment, the, the peer is taking on the role of the learner 
while the other student mm -hmm. has the opportunity to teach those students. Now it is artificial, and I think everyone who's uh, trained uh, teachers understand how artificial that is. But at least they're getting feedback from their peers of what they like and don't like in, in their presentation and how they um, are presenting that information to their peers as learner. A few weeks later, those same students are placed in our what we call our Kids Jam program that we hold uh, over on Boylston Street every Monday at 11. We bring in a number of the preschools. So the students have had the opportunity to discuss amongst themselves and develop lessons, and they either take our feedback or not. <laughs> at this point, but now they have the opportunity uh, to work with preschool kids. And for those of you who've never taught the very young, um, other than your own child, because that doesn't count, <laughs> uh, when you have to have 15 to 30 little ones coming into the room, all of a sudden it's interesting to watch uh, these same students who taught their peers this lesson, because they practiced the lesson with their peers, and now they have to do it with real kids. And the, one of the first comments, many of the students come back and say, wow, this is like herding cats. And we're like, yeah, um, we're trying to explain, you know, here are some of the, the parameters. And your peers were kind of telling you, you've got to look at certain behaviors and react in certain ways. Um, but when they have success, it's a little bit more meaningful coming from their peer than coming from us. Because we'll say, yeah, that was a great job. We really enjoyed that. But it's something in watching the interaction between two students congratulate each other or criticize each other about what they could have done differently. Why you didn't have the attention uh, of, of said student. Why, you, why didn't you present the information this way? Didn't you see that this student was off task or that this child was struggling to keep a, a steady beat and so on and so forth? But those opportunities to reflect, to reflect are rich when they get to hear each other's struggles and share their, their success. We can then frame that uh, to help them succeed during the next opportunity they have to teach. Because they're going to do this over a 15-week period and have multiple opportunities to work in this non-threatening uh, scenario on campus uh, before they ever get out into the schools to go student teach. But we want them to be in this kind of controlled, um, friendly, safe space to experiment amongst their peers. Many years later, <clears throat> by the time they get to the two courses I teach when they're student teaching, they'll reflect uh, back on some of those experiences to talk about I've, they've seen their growth and how they've seen their growth. And even last night in talking with the student teachers who are out in the field now, there are, two, there are, two, no, there are three, excuse me, there are three that happen to be in some of the schools of the area where there's a, a extremely high population of English language learners. And it was interesting to hear my dialogue with them versus the dialogue amongst those three who were in that setting. And to give, listen to the feedback they gave each other, where one was struggling to gain the trust of the students because they're new in the environment, and in another asking the question, well, have you ever thought about learning what their community is like or what language they actually speak? Do you know a few words, blah, blah. And they just gave suggestions to each other. And it was interesting to hear them say, well, I never thought of that. And then in the back of my mind, I'm thinking, we talked about this a semester ago. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but for some odd reason, they didn't remember that one. But it was interesting how it was reinforced once their friend told them something we had talked about the prior semester or even having the opportunity to now, on the days where they aren't teaching, to go observe their friend um, in um, their environment and then have that level of support. Because I think the support uh, is important uh, for their growth and their own uh, development of confidence that, yes, they can do this. Um, where only hearing it from us, <clears throat> excuse me, doesn't have the same effect. Mm -hmm. They're building a network through collaboration. They're building a network through <clears throat> um, their peer learning. They're building this network that will probably last a lot longer than the network and relationships that we develop uh, through 
our interactions with these students. So I think it's important for providing them those opportunities so that it's not, um, they aren't only gaining the information one way from us to them and then expecting them to give that information back to us through exams to think we've, they've mastered it. I think they really show a little bit more mastery when they can show each other that um, this works. I'll leave it there. For them. I, got, I got a quick question here. <clears throat> First of all, on that, uh, when we were referring to um, you know, the fact that the, the student had forgotten that you taught it mm -hmm. a few years ago, uh, Rafael Nadal's uh, coach, uh, for many years, and he's still a support there, is, is his uncle, Uncle Tony. And, um, and he, he had some, uh, some parents complaining about the way their kids were hitting the tennis ball, and they were complaining to uh, Nadal's uncle. And he said, what, uh, he said, what he learns is not what I teach. So it's uh, reminding you of that. But I, I, got, a, I got a question. Is, th is there a part of this when they're doing the, the, the peer learning whereby do you get a student who maybe needs to, is, is, he's, he's actually revising, he's doing a revision while he's going through this, and in so doing, he's going to get maybe somewhere deeper in whatever he's teaching his peer. He's got something, a penny might drop, he hasn't quite got it, and then as he's doing it, he goes, you said, you know, uh, an aha moment through the process. I think some of, some of those aha moments happen uh, on the fly. Yeah. On, when they're... Uh, experiencing that stress yeah. um, because when we first place them in that environment we try to pair them in teams we don't want them to do it alone to feel like you know I'm, I'm just learning this and now you want me to teach the class so we, we kind of pair them up in teams and we watch them interact with each other in the team environment prior to placing the preschoolers with them but then once they've had the opportunity to be in front of that group, and when one seems to fumble, the other one jumps in as a good team player. Right. So that they, they've learned to rescue each other. Because some of the environments that we'll place them out in the community, um, the host teacher at first might just want to team teach with that student teacher before releasing more and more of the class or classes to them. So they want to see how they interact with them as well as the students, and then giving the students the opportunity to do that with their peers there's a sense of comfort and trust Yeah. Um, that if we were to jump in, the first comment we get back during the opportunity reflection is, you know, I, I could have done that. You should have given me a little bit more time. Okay. But when they hear it from their peer, they see it as um, not as threatening. And I, I kind of put that parallel in how we develop relationships outside of the classroom, that sometimes if we hear something from our our, our our own personal friends versus hearing it from a spouse or a partner where we might hear it as criticism. And <laughs> I miss part of life. <laughs> but we hear it in a different, uh, it could be the exact same verbiage, but when you hear it from a friend, it, it seems non-threatening. Yep. And that's what we're trying to get them to understand that they want to build those relationships where it's not non-threatening that they're jumping in to bring you back on track but they're there to help you and encourage you, letting you know that it's okay, we all make mistakes, but here's how to navigate back to your original goal and objective. I, I just want, can I pick yeah. up on that yeah. uh, commonality um, that I'm hearing about uh, stress and threat mm -hmm. um, and, and failure and, and uh, um, you know, all of that that is part of learning. And both of you use different language for sort of guided stress, um, finding the way to create a comfort zone where you can do things that are very hard. And I want to try to tie um, that idea to something that I have heard a lot from a lot of people across our campus, which is even something that came up in a conversation this morning. Um, do we coddle our students too much? Do we, are we too gentle on them with uh, the way that we grade? You know, there's a lot of people who think there's grade inflation across, um, across campus. So, you know, how do you think about that? 
Um, I, I, first of all, as far as the grading, I, I, you know, I've, I've, got to, I've got to stick with what I know. But I would say that there's, there's just too much role playing. There's too much. I see this. Uh, uh, it's really, it, it's like a masquerade. <clears throat> we'll refer to some of our guys on the men's day. So we call it the big me syndrome. Um, big, where, the, where, where, where there, there's sort of an interpretation where that um, uh, stubbornness and resistance to, to anything is a strength. Where it's actually just there's a brittleness in the background and there's mm -hmm. a, there's a vulnerability there, so <clears throat> I think and, and Cecil, what you were talking about, you know, the, the fact that when the peer is teaching, they're they're not as self conscious and the the performing anxiety is down. They don't have a spotlight on them from the from the coach, uh, uh, and and there's a generational thing. Of course, there are three generational things. Um, <clears throat> taking place, so they're, 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 there's a freeing there um, to express themselves. But I think, um, just in, in, in my little world, um, that absolutely what, what, what they're looking for, what the students are, they're actually looking to be led. Um, and Barrett and I were talking about this at the beginning, about this, the, without going off topic here, but this road to leadership, <clears throat> and where does it start? Uh, and one of the things we have, and we, these conversations with my teams, by the way, are quite light. They're, they're, they're light, I try and make them funny. The first thing I try and do with my kids is to try and make them laugh. And we go through a list of, of different types of confidences. They're all phony confidences. And we try and, I try and get them to smile at a, at a recognition. And then we come up with a definition. They come up with a definition of real confidence. Okay, so what is that? <clears throat> so again, we're raising uh, awareness. We, oh my God, fire! We're raising awareness of what is real confidence, and trying to to walk them through, and to recognize how it manifests itself through their training, through their playing, through their interaction with their teammates. But um, there's a th there's another component of this, or there's a component of this that's taking them out into the world, and that it's okay to be vulnerable. And, and everybody is, and how do you navigate yourself through that? But giving them um, a, a, a real, that's why I said you know, a few minutes ago, stress with answers is actually giving them a pathway through it, I think is the most important thing. So we may have group uh, team meetings, we have these discussions, um, but a lot of the work, and when it goes deep and it's getting much more stressful, is happening one on one. And then is happening from the captains to the student athletes, and then right across peer to peer. And we see these, we see these people become more self-reliant first, and then there's an independence, and then they become uh, a role model. Just just in a very small group, they're influencing two or three people around them. Mm -hmm. This is the road to leadership. But before there's any leadership, this is a role really to just feeling better. And, um, you know, without ridiculing um, the, con the American Constitution, which is the pursuit of, of happiness. You know, I tell my guys that, you know, uh, happiness is a moving target. But you can absolutely uh, give yourself a roadmap and a compass to having a quiet mind. Um, and how do you find that? How do you find a peace inside you? Because that, to me, is a starting point, and lots of things, a lot of good things, can happen from there. So, if you're looking at the, the stress moments um, and how that might affect their learning, and and I like to see sometimes that, that to say that um, in looking at it from a let's say if, we, if I look at it from a team aspect, yeah. um, when we're teaching large ensemble more middle school, high school experiences, which some of you might have participated in when you were, uh, were students. Um, one school of thought uh, when you're trying to develop the learner and, and trying to get them to understand that they're uh, teaching to that particular ensemble is to put students in a particular place and that's where they're seated. Um, I came from a different school of thought um, and how I was educated in looking at, well, are you trying to build a team um, or is there just one set hierarchy and that's how it's going to remain? So that the student, when you have one set hierarchy, the students aren't necessarily um, encouraged to work together because it's about who gets to place first 
versus who's sitting last. Where in looking at a team, and, and I'm, I'm glad I had a professor that opened my eyes to that in the sense that in trying to build a team approach, I'm trying to see all of the students as equal and trying to get them to understand that they need to be seen as equal. And that in that team approach, it's going to take their entire collaborative effort to make this imaginary group, which I always tell them band is imaginary, choir is imaginary, orchestra is imaginary, because you're, yes, you're individuals, but you're coming to create this sound that can't be created without all the individual parts. But with that said, in order for them to learn from each other, yes, they're going to be people who play the first part, who play second, who play third. But I've also incorporated this uh, team building thing where you're playing first on this piece, but on the next piece you're going to play second, and on the next piece you're going to play third, so that I constantly rotate. And that the students who used to play first can give the students who are playing first the next time around hints of what it was like for them to take on that role. Um, the idea is for them to be able to take leadership positions, for them to feel the pressure of uh, being up out front, um, because they need that opportunity to be able to step in when someone else can't do it. So you're developing a different working relationship within that group that I found much uh, better than having one set hierarchy that you would keep for the entire year. Hearing it from them, it, it took time to change the culture in the community I taught in. Because you still have the parents that would come in and say, well, my child, <laughs> my child should be playing first. <laughs> your child will play first, but your child will also play second. Your child will also play third, because all the parts are important. And how I was able to change uh, that community's uh, way of thought, which I probably wouldn't do today. But I, uh, during a parent-teacher conference, I turned around the piano. For those of you who have a piano at home, you have the 88 keys. And I had a hammer. And I said, you know, the piano um, makes beautiful music, and all 88 keys are equal. And all 88 keys are important. But if your child plays first, which key with this hammer should I knock off because it's not important? And when they started to understand the concept that all of them are important, I said, well, if I take off the B flat, if I knock off all the B flats, you know, that leaves me with no B flats. I have to think about music where there's no B flat. If I knock off all the Ds, and I have to get them to understand that it's a the piano is a collaborative instrument. Every key is important, just as though your child is important in this imaginary thing we call band, orchestra, or choir. And they all need to work together and support each other, regardless of the part they play, and to be able to articulate that and take on the leadership positions of each one teach one, helping those who are struggling. Because when they work together as that team, we all benefit. We all improve. It's not about me, the soloist. It's about us, the ensemble. Cool. Very cool. There's, um, there's some, something kind of profound here, and I'm, I don't have the, the words for it. But you, know, you said sort of you want everyone to be equal. And, and that great example about the, the piano, and you wouldn't want to lose one key. But for both of your work, mm -hmm. uh, performance and um, you know, sort of excellence in performance, and in your case, winning, mm -hmm. is really important. So how do you think about the tension between that everyone has something to give here for the team? But then also you have individual excellence that needs to get called out. And, and in your case, you're actually very visibly saying yeah. you want you, you you were you're here or there with one yeah. another. In 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 sport, you know, and and it's it's hard to think of all the cliches that I could go through right now. Okay, so I won't do that. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but um, but what's important to understand, and I'm sure there's going to be so much commonalities here, and I'm loving what Cecil is saying here. Um, I'm allowed to call him Cecil, by the way. He told me that it's a British name, so there you go, and he, from the Bahamas. So <laughs> Cecil in America. Sorry about that. And, um, 
But of course, the whole thing, the focus is actually not on outcome or result. The focus is on the process. So everything, the mental program, everything we do is process oriented, uh, is, is performance oriented. And as far as, you know, so here we, we've got the challenge matches, we've got outside matches. But one thing that's very powerful um, uh, and uh, uh, I'm, I'm trying to think of the book where I heard this, this first from, it'll come to me in a second, but the, this, this author was talking about uh, a craving for a future belonging. Um, and, uh, and, and I can absolutely see that on my team. So in, in uh, you know, our squads are between 13 and 16 strong. Nine matches count. Everybody might play, but nine matches count. So it's pr pretty clear that we look at top three, middle three, bottom three, and those that are off. And there's, they're always craving and looking for this future belonging. Um, and there's a lot of peer learning, peer conversations taking place because of this desire, this hunger uh, to get this recognition. And then, of course, it's broken down with the help of the coaches and video analysis. Well, what have you got to get, what have you got to do to get to this future? The, the the talent code is the name of the book. It's a bloody good book, by the way. You can read it in a weekend. They're the only types of books I read. <laughs> <laughs> and um, uh, but I see this. This is this is quite a, a powerful uh, uh, mo motivator. So I don't know if that crosses over to your, your um, world? In, in some senses, <clears throat> it does. I think what also helps us to um, elevate their mastery, for us, we're, we're also trying to get them to understand the importance of the rubrics that we've established so that they have a better understanding of where they fit into um, level, different levels of mastery. So in establishing some type of rubric to say you know, that they've met that particular standard or have not met that standard, provides them with enough feedback um, to be able uh, to, to revise what they've done, reflect on what has already been accomplished and what needs to still be accomplished. And they have the opportunity themselves as they evaluate each other. Because our evaluation is one thing, and they, they might see that as finite. But when they have the opportunity, when it's not their turn to teach the class, and their peers are team teaching or solo teaching uh, the class, when the, the students are evaluating uh, their peers, the rubric takes on much more meaning uh, to them. Because they've had an opportunity to reflect and say, OK, did they actually follow through in the plan that they presented to us? And was it effective? Did they see growth? Um, and that rubric establishes uh, kind of a benchmark for mm -hmm. them. Mm -hmm. And I think they all buy into that when they've had the opportunity to also enforce it or, or use it, I'll say, better than enforce um, in those settings. So I just want to um, say out loud that it, you have, uh, with your examples, conveyed that peer learning is a very useful tool for creating a, uh, an environment of inclusive excellence and really allowing people from diverse backgrounds to um, connect with one another uh, around those mastery attainment levels in, in a different way. Um, and, and just to pick up on something that you said, Mike, the, uh, the way that all of us are looking for a sense of belonging and that this kind of uh, peer learning with one another can lend itself to a, a, a sense of, of belonging. Um, so what, what is the question that you would wish I would ask you hmm. about peer learning? <laughs> what will it look like in the future, maybe? I'll pose that question. Okay. So what will peer learning look like in the future? I think uh, when you look at... Um, the changes in American education, PK-12, are in higher ed. Many of us, uh, I would say many of us in the room were brought up in the brick and mortar, ex through the brick and mortar experience. But we're now in, uh, in an era where online education or hybrid education has taken um, a hold of uh, the environment. And it looks like it's here to stay. 
What will it look like in the future? I think we'll probably see more of it. And it will be important for uh, those who are learning online or in some type of hybrid uh, format to have the opportunity to discuss what they're learning in that particular environment where they might have had that opportunity in the traditional brick and mortar class where they can bounce ideas off of each other and they're actually there. And we're trying to artificially do that with some of our, our hybrid tools. I have one faculty member that teaches one of our classes in a hybrid format. And we compare the experience of the students who are taking that exact same class in the traditional setting versus that hybrid setting. And it's interesting to see what students say about what they're learning because they're there with a peer every day or the days that the class meets versus the ones that only see their peers after they've finished the online module and then there is some opportunity for them to gather and, and talk through the, the concepts that they learned that maybe in the future we need to understand that there still has to be some type of human interaction that we have to provide uh, as we continue to embrace um, the convenience of being able to educate people uh, in this new, uh, with this new tool. That's great. We, we are at time. Mike, can you close us out with one piece of advice you'd want uh, this audience um, to know? Uh, one piece of advice. I'll let, I'll let uh, Cecil go first. <laughs> I mean, let, me, let me think. Oh, well, um, most of us teach uh, based on how we've been taught in the past. And sometimes that's good and sometimes that's bad. But as we move forward, I think we have to look at all the possibilities of the students there in front of us and what those learning styles are like and how diverse those populations are and will become. And the settings will change. Yes, we'll be a little uh, bit outside of our comfort level. But sometimes giving the students that, that are in front of us an opportunity to experiment with some of the concepts that we present to them and having them um, articulate to us what they've learned or want us to do uh, better and helping them grasp those concepts might not be a bad thing. Sometimes we have to listen because we're preparing them for a future we can't see. We're preparing them for a future mm -hmm. that we hope will be as successful as the, the, the past that all of us have shared. And I think um, if we're open enough to looking at all the possibilities and means and how uh, young people uh, more uh, uh, seasoned people learn <laughs> that I think it's going to be a successful uh, education will still be something that's valued uh, for generations to come and it won't be something that's so isolated just for the few but really for everyone. Okay this is going to be a bit out in left field. <clears throat> And it's got nothing to do with peer learning. So if I had two, two, two uh, offers of advice, I would, I would refer back, first of all, to um, your Oh My God file awareness. And then I'm going to tell you this funny little story. In um, a few months ago, uh, and then something, again, from this, this book, The Talent Code, that absolutely summed me up. So I was up in Toronto. I was teaching this camp. And after two or three days, uh, and I can, I can be quite, um, quite a hard coach. Uh, I used to be much harsher when I was younger. I've actually mellowed, some would say, too much. <clears throat> but um, so this kid, this kid um, um, at a lunchtime class session said, um, what makes you such a good coach? And I said, well, it's very nice of you to say that, young man. I said, that's not. For me, what makes you such an effective coach? I said, it's not for me to say <clears throat> that I'm a good or effective coach, but I said, if it is anything, it is down to one word. And there were all the kids, there's about 30 kids, and I wrote up the first three letters. And the first three letters were I, R, R. And this kid looked at this, these three letters and he said, irresistible. <laughs> <clears throat> um, which, of course, I thanked him for. And of course, the word wasn't irresistible, it was irritability. <clears throat> So this is going to sound kind of odd. <clears throat> I know it's out in left field. Sorry about this. But you said one piece of advice. And in this, in this book, The Talent Code, 
whose author's name I've forgotten, he talks about um, a strategic impatience. And I've always found that when, when our program is firing <clears throat> and it's undeniable, anyone can walk in and you can feel there's an energy, there's a real synergistic thing going on. It's usually started because the old man has a little bit of irritability that day hmm. and it works very well. That's the only advice I've got. <laughs> Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you to both of you. This is really great. Thank you. Wow.